Yeah, welcome everyone. So I, as, as Fumi said, my name is Joe Wiegand. Uh, welcome to this, our global medical physics education series. Uh, so we started this lecture series about a year and a half ago, it's almost been. Um, and normally in these lectures, we go quite deep into a single topic in medical physics. Uh, however, over, over the last year and a half, I've gotten a number of requests to instead of go deep into a single topic, try to give like a pretty broad overview of medical physics as a whole. Um, so for that, I that is obviously quite a, a tall task because medical physics is a huge field. Um, but I figure I can give it a an attempt and see see if I can uh, present medical physics in a cogent way for you guys. And as a disclaimer, uh, this is not meant to be comprehensive, right? So medical physics at the bare minimum will require a two year master's degree and then two years on the job clinical training. So there's no way that I can possibly condense four years of education and training into one hour lecture. So I'm not going to be going terribly deep into each topic although I'm going to be introducing a variety of topics and uh, uh, I think giving a pretty good introduction for those of you, whether you want to embark on this journey of medical physics education or, or go a different route. So let's start with the very basics, right? What is medical physics? And, and the basic definition I can think of is just the application of physics to medicine, right? That's pretty obvious. Uh, but this doesn't really specify what field of medicine we're applying physics to. The two most common, far and away, are radiation therapy and diagnostic imaging. I must mention, though, that there are various bodies of medical physics internationally that are pushing initiatives to try to extend the scope of what we do. Um, and apply it to different fields of medicine, such as, as surgery or cardiology. But for, for the most part, uh, the majority of physicists in the world are actively applying their skills in either radiation therapy, diagnostic imaging, nuclear medicine, or some combination of those. Uh, so for, for this talk, we're largely going to focus on radiation therapy and diagnostic imaging. So no introductory talk is, is really complete without a very brief history lesson. So I, I just want to describe the two sort of historical developments that really led to the existence of medical physics. Uh, they both uh, coincidentally happened right around the same time in the mid 1890s. Uh, so the first was in Germany uh, by Wilhelm Rankin. Uh, he discovered the existence of x-rays. So the story goes is that he actually discovered this quite incidentally, like he, he was not trying to discover it. Uh, he just randomly stumbled upon the discovery of x-rays and then went home that very day and took the first ever diagnostic x-ray image of a human, which was his wife. As you can see, it was her hand uh, and she is wearing her wedding ring, as you can clearly see in the image. Um, but the sort of neat thing was just how quickly this technology sort of uh, was adapted into the medical setting. So within just two months of Röntgen's discovery of the x-ray, the knowledge of x-rays and its medical applications traveled overseas. Uh, here in the U.S., the first uh, diagnostic x-ray image that was ever acquired was actually acquired at my hospital at, at uh, Dartmouth Medical Center. Um, but yeah, so basically within just a few months, knowledge of the discovery of x-ray and its application to medicine sort of spread throughout the world that quickly. And this was in a very drastically different world in the 1890s where, where information didn't spread as quickly as it does today. The other seminal discovery happened in 1896, and this was the discovery of radioactivity. Uh, so it was done initially uh, by two independent groups, uh, both out of France, actually. So the first, the person who is 
credited with the discovery of radioactivity is Henry Becquerel. Uh, he discovered radioactive uranium salts. Um, and then uh, shortly thereafter, Pierre and Marie Curie sort of carried on this work, subsequently discovered radium and polium, pol polonium, uh, two radioactive elements, and uh, sort of drove forward the theoretical framework of understanding how radioactivity uh, works. So where Becquerel is credited with uh, uh, the discovery, Pierre and Marie Curie are credited with really uh, the groundbreaking and, and foundation laying research in radioactivity. And uh, both sets received Nobel Prizes. So let's jump into the actual content. So we're going to start with radioactivity. So radioactivity is the observation that some nuclei can spontaneously transition to another species. And normally this happens when the nuclei in question is unstable. Uh, usually this tends to occur with large nuclei, so nuclei with a lot of protons and neutrons, um, but that is not necessarily the case. There are radioactive uh, species that are quite small nuclei as well. Uh, the main types can be remembered quite easily if you know the first three letters of the Greek alphabet, alpha, beta, and gamma. Uh, so initially when they were discovered, it wasn't quite sure what these uh, types of radiation were. Uh, so the people just called them alpha, beta, and gamma as kind of placeholders. Uh, we have obviously since figured out what type of of radiate what type of particles are emitted in these radiative processes, um, but the names alpha, beta, and gamma have stuck nonetheless. Uh, so basically, alpha decay is the emission of a helium nucleus, so two protons and two neutrons. Uh, this is typically occurs in very heavy nuclei. Um, there's beta decay, of which you can have two types. So there's electron decay or beta minus decay, and then positron decay or beta plus decay. And the positron uh, is essentially the antiparticle of the electron, and it can be thought of having the, as having the same mass as the electron, but a positive charge instead. Um, there is then gamma decay, and a gamma is simply a photon, so uh, the same as a particle of light, except uh, it has higher energies, typically. Um, and then there's electron capture, uh, which is essentially the, the transition of an atomic proton, a, a nuclear proton, and an orbital electron. Uh, they sort of combine with each other and as a pair transition into a neutron. Uh, so electron capture is a uh, competing decay mechanism as positron decay. We'll, we'll see what that means on the next slide. But uh, ultimately, we can summarize these decay decays via these uh, radioactivity equations, uh, where here we see uh, uranium-238 decaying by uh, alpha decay. Uh, so yeah, here is a very useful plot to think of when we're trying to determine whether a given radioact or nuclear species will be stable or not, whether it will or will not undergo radioactive decay. And if you, so in this plot, they're plotting the number of neutrons on the vertical axis and the number of protons or the atomic number on the horizontal axis. And basically that there is a line or a valley of stability uh, sort of corresponding to nuclear species that tend to be stable, right? And as you can see, at sort of low atomic number, so for small nuclei, uh, it's typically stable when you have roughly the same number of neutrons as you have protons. Um, the As the atomic number increases, however, uh, it typically shifts so that stability tends to occur when there are slightly more neutrons than protons. And the reason for this is because of the, the repulsive nature of the electromagnetic force, right? When you have all these protons bundled into a nucleus, they want to repel each other. Um, 
So you need a stronger attractive force and the attractive force that holds the nucleus together is called the, the strong nuclear force. And the strong nuclear force becomes more cohesive when there are more nucleons. So, so the more neutrons actually stabilize the, the nucleus uh, against the tendency to repel due to uh, electromagnetics. Um, and basically, depending where a given uh, nuclear species is on this chart, will determine if it's not stable in which direction it will want to decay. So for, for species that are on the bottom right hand side of the valley of stability, uh, these tend to be proton heavy or proton rich. Hence, they will want to get rid of a proton and get more neutrons. So they would decay by something like uh, positron or beta plus decay or electron capture. Things on the top left of the, the graph are neutron rich and hence would want to get rid of a neutron and get a proton. So they would want to decay via uh, electron or beta minus decay or emission of a neutron. So the mathematics of radioactive decay is quite important and it's quite simple, I would say. Uh, so basically, uh, ensembles of radioactive species will decay via just a simple mono exponential. Uh, at least that's how we typically model it. Uh, so basically, if you start off with a number of radioactive atoms called N0, uh, and you want to determine the number of radioactive atoms at some time later, T, uh, you can then easily calculate that by just exponentially decaying the initial amount. And this uh, characteristic uh, uh, constant here, lambda, is known as the decay constant. Uh, it sort of characterizes the, the speed of the decay, let's say. Um, it's defined as 0.692, which is the not natural log of two, divided by the half-life. And the half-life is just the time it takes for an ensemble of radioactive atoms to decay to half the original number that you started with, right? So obviously, if you have a, a long half-life, that means it decays quite slowly. If you have a short half-life, it decays away quite rapidly. However, usually in, in practical settings, we don't normally talk about the number of radioactive atoms. We instead talk about this quantity that's more, more useful, known as activity, which is essentially just the number of decays per unit time or the number of, of radioactive transitions per unit time. So it's defined quite simply as just the product of that decay constant lambda times the number of radioactive atoms. So because it's proportional to the number of radioactive atoms, it also just decays away exponentially. But here, uh, it's more of a useful quantity because it quantifies the number of disintegrations per second. The SI unit for activity is the Becquerel, named after Henry Becquerel, who we just discussed uh, was the discoverer of radioactivity. Um, and the Becquerel is defined as one disintegration per second. And really, that's also not a very practical quantity because usually when we're dealing yeah. with radioactivity, with radioactive material, we are dealing with uh, many more than one disintegration per second. Um, so uh, the unit that we use more practically is the Curie, named after the other important people in radioactivity. Uh, and the Curie is defined as 3.7 times 10 to the 10th Becquerel, or 3.7 times 10 to the 10th disintegrations per second. And while that might seem as quite random, uh, it was actually defined historically before they really understood the process because it's actually the activity that you uh, observe for one gram of radium-226, which, uh, which, which was the radioactive material that the Curies were working with back in the 1890s and early 1900s. So now we understand really how radioactivity works, uh, so we want to talk about maybe some applications
of radioactivity. And the first, uh, which has been around for over a hundred years, is a technique known as brachytherapy. So brachy is a Greek prefix, meaning short. And when we say short, we mean like short range uh, relative to uh, compared to external beam where, where the radiation source is coming in from, from far away. Here, we are directly placing the radioactivity either inside or directly adjacent to a tumor. Um, yeah, so uh, there are a number of uh, uh, sites that we treat with brachytherapy. Uh, the first is, uh, the most important is gynecological tumors. So, so tumors of the female reproductive system, uh, particularly cervical cancer. And this is actually very important in a global health setting because actually cervical cancer is far and away the most common cancer in sub-Saharan Africa, which I know uh, many of the attendees here at this talk are from. Uh, prostate cancer is another type of cancer that is frequently treated with uh, brachytherapy. And there are a number of other examples. I, I uh, won't go into the details, but basically it's any type of cancers that are easily accessible, right? If something is very deep in the gastrointestinal tract, probably you're going to not want to do brachytherapy because then it becomes a very invasive procedure. But if something is very, very accessible, like there's a body cavity leading to it, or you can access, access it interstitially without going through anything important, uh, then brachytherapy becomes a reasonable option. So prostate brachy is illustrated here in uh, this, this picture um, shown here on the bottom left. So here uh, we are using a transrectal ultrasound to actually be able to see the prostate and guide the, the needle uh, placement. And then usually um, radioactive seeds or, or uh catheters used for, for high-dose rate brachytherapy are in place, placed in the prostate. So that leads me to the next topic, that there are sort of two major domains of brachytherapy that we split them up uh, relative, depending on their dose rate. Uh, so there's high-dose rate brachytherapy, HDR, and low-dose rate brachytherapy, LDR. Uh, typically, uh, HDR procedures because you have the high dose rate, they're typically done on an outpatient basis where the patient might come in, get the device implanted in them. Then you put the radioactive material in them for something on the order of five to 20 minutes. Uh, where LDR procedures, so then in HDR, you take the source out, you take the device out and the patient goes home. With LDR, however, uh, typically, the the implant is permanent or pseudo permanent. Uh, so the big example is brachytherapy seeds for prostate uh, radiation. Uh, so here, actually, uh, these very small seeds of either iodine one twenty five or palladium one hundred three are permanently placed in the prostate. They have a quite short half life on the order of weeks. Uh, so they decay decay away quite rapidly. So only for the first maybe one or two months are they actually depositing appreciable dose, but still the seeds stay in the patient uh, indefinitely for, for the rest of their life. Uh, the main radionuclides that we use in brachytherapy, uh, the main one for HDR used here in, in the developing world is uh, iridium-192. Uh, this is uh, quite useful in, in HDR brachytherapy. However, the half-life is on the order of two and a half months. So in countries where they don't produce their own radioactive material, it becomes logistically challenging to have to replace your brachytherapy source every two or three months. Uh, so ultimately what they use for HDR brachytherapy then is cobalt-60, which has a much longer half-life uh, on the order of five plus years. Uh, so typically you don't need to change the source, but every five to seven years. Um, the, the downside though, is that the energy is higher. So you need more shielding in the bunker 
where you deliver this uh, brachytherapy, um, but that's only a minor downside relative to the, the logistical barriers that you uh, get around. Uh, and as I mentioned, the two common uh, LDR radionuclides are iodine-125 and palladium-103. Another application of radioactivity that uh, has been more or less phased out here in the U.S., but is still very much a workhorse of radiation therapy throughout the world, is a cobalt-60-based teletherapy. So basically here you have a radioactive source housed in a head, very well shielded. Um, and when the patient is on the table, the, the shielding sort of opens up so that they're then exposed to the very highly radioactive source. Um, and then when their treatment time is over, the, the, the housing closes back up. So the patient is treated that way. Um, as I said, we don't really have much cobalt-60 based radiation therapy here in the U.S. anymore, but I had the opportunity. I worked for one month in um, Wanza, Tanzania at a Bugando Medical Center, and there I got to work uh, quite a lot with their, their uh, Babatron Cobalt-60 uh, unit. And a friend from India recently sent me this picture uh, shown here on the right. This is actually a shielded Cobalt-60 source from a Cobalt-60 unit. And actually, the, the activity of the source is 10,000 curies, which, which to me sounds crazy. Uh, brachytherapy source, which I typically think of as being a lot of radiation, is three orders of magnitude smaller than that, on the order of like 10 curie. So, so uh, 10,000 curie is a, is a very, very uh, high radiation source. Uh, so luckily, there's a lot of good shielding there. So let's switch gears from uh, radioactivity to uh, more of Rankin's domain or x-rays. Uh, so this is a general schematic of an x-ray tube. Uh, it's a quite simple device and has been around for over 100 years, but it really hasn't changed much in that time. Uh, so basically, you have these two critical components, cathode, which is usually a, a tungsten filament, and then the anode, which has a tungsten target. Um, and the important thing to remember is that the cathode and the anode are kept at a different voltage. So there's a voltage difference between the two. And that voltage difference actually goes on to define sort of the energy of the x-rays that are produced. Uh, so basically what is done is that the cathode or that, that tungsten filament is heated up. Electrons are boiled off by thermionic emission. Um, because of the voltage, they are then accelerated towards the anode, where they are made to strike the target. Um, and the, the electrons that are being accelerated uh, interact with the atoms in the target, and they're deflected. And this deflection being sort of a pseudo deceleration or a change in direction uh, causes the electrons to then irradiate photons via the mechanism of bremsstrahlung or breaking radiation. And then we can then sort of shape that beam and, and use it for, for whatever purpose that we're trying to use it for. Uh, typically, these X-ray tubes uh, operate at lower energies. So they're typically useful at in diagnostic imaging exams. Uh, for radiation therapy, the concept is quite similar, uh, but we actually use a device called a linear accelerator instead. And this is because it's not so easy to apply uh, such a high voltage uh, without damaging the device. Uh, so instead of accelerating our electrons, so we still have an electron gun or a cathode where the electrons are boiled off. And we still have them striking a target. So the concept is the same. The only difference really is uh, that the way that we accelerate the electrons is different. We use this accelerating waveguide, which needs to be powered by, by microwaves. So we have these additional components, uh, klystron and or, or, or a magnetron, uh, depending on how the, the accelerator is designed what energy we're, we're accelerating to. 
but these devices either uh, uh, amplify or create microwaves respectively. Um, and then those microwaves are used to accelerate the electron. Electrons, the electrons are then made to bend in a 270 degree angle, uh, at least in this design shown here, um, and then strike the target. Uh, and then the, the electrons produce Bremsstrahlung photons that are mainly forward peak because of the high energy. We then go into this gantry head where the, the uh, radiation beam is then sort of uh, uh, shaped via these collimators and then ultimately exits into the patient. And uh, I wanna draw your attention to this sort of bottom device, uh, the multi-leaf collimator, uh, just because uh, it really sort of changed how we practice radiation therapy uh, in much of the world. Uh, and it's quite a simple device, really. I mean, it's, it's uh, complex mechanically, but, but conceptually it's quite a simple device. Uh, it's basically, you just have many of these thin tungsten leaves, right, on the order of 120 usually. Um, and these thin tungsten leaves can be positioned in a very precise way so that you then sort of shape the beam such that the beam is very conformal to the tumor that you're trying to treat. And yeah, so it's a, quite a simple concept. Basically, you're just you're just blocking the part of the beam that you don't want to treat and you're letting through the part of the beam that you want to treat. But, but this really has sort of revolutionized our field. Uh, much of the work for this was done in the late 80s and early 90s, uh, mainly by Anders Brahm in Karolinska in Stockholm, Sweden. <clears throat> but then this, the, the multi-leaf collimator, or MLC, paved the way for this sort of change in paradigm in, in radiation therapy treatment called intensity modulated radiation therapy. So here, or IMRT. So here we, we use these MLCs to very um, uh, heavily modulate the radiation beam so that we can very, very, uh, even more so conformally deliver the radiation to the target while trying to spare the surrounding healthy tissue. And like I said, it sort of changed a paradigm shift because before IMRT, all of the radiation treatment plans were done in a forward fashion, meaning that the person making the plan sets the beam angle, they uh, set the collimator angle, choose any beam modulation devices that they wanna use, and then calculate the dose see, is this dose good or not? Do I want to change it? Maybe I need to change the beam angle. Maybe I need to change the beam modulating device, whatever you need to do. Um, but it's all done in a forward fashion, meaning you set sort of the, the beam characteristics a priori. IMRT led for the, the paradigm shift to inverse planning, where instead what we do is we tell the treatment planning software what we want to achieve a priori. And then the treatment planning software via this, these uh, optimization algorithms determines the proper beam angles and column, uh, not beam angles and collimator angles, but uh, MLC shapes and then beam fluences through the, through which, uh, the, the dose that we want to deliver is, is actually achieved. Uh, so this was developed mainly in the 90s at the German Cancer Research Center by uh, Thomas Bortfeld. Um, and ultimately, uh, we have moved past IMRT, at least here in the developed world, uh, for by using uh, what's called VMAT or volumetric modulated arc therapy. So basically the way I like to think of VMAT is it's, it's like IMRT, but while the gantry is rotating. So the moving gantry allows you to have many more sort of degrees of freedom in your, your optimization algorithm and allows you to achieve very, very smooth and conformal uh, radiation therapy dose distribution. So, so this is really, at least here in the US, it's the workhorse of
of many of our radiation therapy treatments, VMAT. So, okay, we've talked a lot about how we produce radiation via X-ray generators, linear accelerators, or radioactive materials, but what actually happens when the radiation enters the patient's body and how, how is that uh, biologically or clinically relevant to, to the treatment of cancer patients? Uh, so the first concept that we need to discuss is the concept of radiation dose. Uh, so dose is defined as the energy imparted per unit mass of tissue irradiated. And, and I always, when I first was learning medical physics, I always questioned, why do we normalize by the mass? And, and the reason is because this is the quantity that correlates with tissue response. And ultimately, that's what we're um, concerned about, right? In radiation therapy, we want to kill the tumor, right? In diagnostic imaging, we want to not harm the healthy tissue, right? So we're always concerned about the tissue response and dose simply correlates with tissue response. So we use dose as a surrogate for tissue response in a variety of settings. So the unit of dose is named the gray. It's named after Lewis Harold Gray shown here in the picture. And it's defined as one joule per kilogram. Uh, you'll also hear people talk about the sievert, uh, which is used uh, whenever you're weighting by uh, different radiation types, like protons versus electrons versus photons, or by tissue types. As you can imagine, different tissues have different sensitivities to radiation, so they, they respond differently given the same radiation dose. Um, and here we, we describe the sievert as sort of the the, the placeholder to let you know that you've sort of modified the gray by, by weighting it by one of these factors. So once produced, uh, photons will be taken out of a radiation beam by two main mechanisms. And we call that sort of removal of photons, the attenuation of photons. So the first is a purely geometric concept it's known as the inverse square law. So refer to the figure here on the left. Uh, so if, if a number of photons are produced at a source shown here at S, right? As the, the, the photons or the, the radiative particles spread outward, they sort of, if they're, they're allowed to spread out isotropically, they spread out along the surface of a sphere, right? Meaning that, a given cross-sectional area, as you move further away from the source, if it's the same area, it will intersect less and less particles, right? Uh, and because it's spreading out along the surface of a sphere, and if you remember back to probably high school geometry, that the surface area of a sphere is proportional to the radius squared, right? The 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 fluence of radiative particles will fall off geometrically by one over R squared. And what this means is if that, that you count the number of particles passing a cross-sectional area uh, at a given distance, if you move twice as far away, the, the fluence or dose of particles that you will receive uh, falls off by a factor of four because it's the square. Um, so this means that whenever you're working with radiation, right, distance is always important. So I always try to be as far away from the, the radiation that I'm working with as possible to be able to do the task. Because if you step twice as far away, your radiation dose or radiation exposure will drop down by a factor of four. Uh, it's interesting to note that the mathematics uh, so, sorry. So then the other um, uh, way that photons are removed from a beam is by attenuation through matter. So as the photons travel through matter, they interact via a variety of mechanisms that we will talk about on subse subsequent slides. They are then removed from the beam. And it's interesting to note that the mathematics of this attenuation uh, which is caused by absorption and scatter, uh, is 
very identical or analogous, let's say, to the mathematics of, of uh, radioactivity. So if we uh, start with an initial intensity, I zero, right? The, the beam then enters the patient or the phantom and travels a depth X, we can calculate the intensity at depth X uh, using this exponential decay equation. Here, mu is the attenuation coefficient. It's analogous to that decay constant in radioactivity. It's defined as 0.692 divided by the half value layer. And the half value layer is analogously defined as the depth in tissue through which a radiation beam has its intensity cut to a, by a factor of two. So one of the things that we often want to measure when we are trying to characterize a, a radiation therapy treatment unit is its percent depth dose or PDD. This is a very important concept in uh, radiation therapy medical physics um, because the PDD characterizes sort of the spectral or energy content of the radiation beam, which is very important. We definitely want to characterize that because that sort of uh, allows us to know how the radiation will, will travel through the patient when we're treating them, right? Uh, the important thing to note is that different energy radiation beams have different um, uh, percent depth dose characteristics. As shown here, you have a 6 MV beam and an 18 MV beam. And as you can see, the 6 one, which is a little bit darker, it's more black, uh, achieves the place where it achieves the dose maximum or what we call D max more shallower and then falls off more rapidly. The 18 MV beam being a higher energy, which means it's more penetrating, uh, will achieve D max at a deeper depth and then will fall off less rapidly, right? So let's switch gears and now talk about how exactly these uh, photons are taken out of the beam. So there's a number of important mechanisms that we that we always discuss. And this one is by far the least important. Uh, so if you're going to forget anything, forget this slide. Uh, this is Raleigh scattering. I'm just talking about it for sake of completeness. It's also called coherent scattering. Uh, and basically, the photon scatters off a bound electron. It occurs at very low energies. And the reason why it's not very important is because it doesn't result in any change in energy uh, between the photon and the medium. So, so really, no energy is imparted via Rayleigh scattering. So for our purposes, calculating radiation dose, uh, it's inconsequential. Uh, significantly more uh, important is the photoelectric effect. Uh, so photoelectric effect was actually famously described by uh, Albert Einstein when he was in Bern, Switzerland in 1905. And basically, uh, fun fact, so Albert Einstein for all his contributions in physics, be it general relativity, uh, the Brownian motion description, uh, he actually won his Nobel Prize for the photoelectric effect, so for uh, medical physics contribution. Um, but yeah, basically the photoelectric effect uh, describes uh, the photon's interaction with the orbital electron. And ultimately what happens is that the photon disappears so it, it, it ceases to exist, and then an electron is ejected. Uh, this is typical uh, in inner shell electrons. Uh, so then you'll have sort of a cascade of outer shell electrons falling down and then uh, resulting characteristic X-rays. But ultimately, uh, the photoelectric effect, the probability of the photoelectric effect scales as Z cubed over E cubed. And remember, Z is the, the atomic number. So the higher atomic number materials will more preferentially undergo the photoelectric effect. And E is the energy. So since it's one over E cubed, that means the photoelectric effect dominates at lower energies. And this is important 
at diagnostic energies where we usually use lower energy x-rays sort of by construction. And we'll talk more about that later. Uh, and then we can also calculate the energy of the, the ejected photoelectron just using energy conservation principles. Uh, the other extremely important uh, photon interaction mechanism is that of Compton scattering or the Compton effect. Uh, so here, uh, an electron is also ejected. Usually these are more likely to be outer shell electrons, um, but the photon doesn't disappear this time. The photon is actually deflected at an angle. Uh, this is what's most commonly seen at therapeutic energies. So in radiation therapy, the Compton scattering dominates throughout, throughout all uh, therapeutic energies. And also important to note that the Compton scattering is uh, independent of the atomic number. Another one slightly less important is pair production. Uh, so here pair production is the photon spontaneously converting into an electron positron pair, which the positron will then travel a little bit and then annihilate with uh, an electron in the media and produce uh, two, two photons. Uh, but in general, uh, it's important to note that there is a threshold energy that the photon needs to have for this to even be possible. And that's two times the mass of the electron. The mass of the electron uh, using Einstein's uh, mass energy equivalence is uh, like five, around 500 keV right? Actually 511. So two times the mass of the electron is a little bit over one MeV. So you must have a little bit over one MeV for pair production to be possible. But it only starts to become really important at above, let's say, 20 th or 30 MeV. Uh, there's also this one uh, process called photo disintegration. So here, the interaction is between the photon and the nucleus. And the photon is absorbed and a nuclear fragment or a bundle of protons and neutrons are ejected. This is most likely at high energies and low atomic numbers. And this has a sort of real world consequence is because why it's why we need to shield high energy um, uh, linear accelerator vaults for neutrons. So, so below 10 MB, uh, neutrons are not really uh, produced at great numbers. So we don't really shield uh, linear accelerators that have N or below uh, MV energies. However, when you start using higher energies like 15 or 18 MV, neutrons are then starting to be produced in, in substantial quantities. So you would want to not only shield the bunker for, for photons, that's obvious because we're, we're treating with photons, but you also want to shield for the neutrons that are produced in the, in the linear accelerator head, usually. Uh, this slide just sort of uh, summarizes the energy dependence. So basically on the vertical axis, we're plotting the, the probability of interaction the horizontal axis is a logarithmic energy scale. So we see that at very low energies, the photoelectric effect is most important. At some energy around 30 keV, uh, it starts to cross the Compton effect and the Compton effect becomes the more dominant interaction and stays the more dominant interaction for three orders of magnitude and energy until you get about 20 or 30 MeV, at which point pair production starts to be the dominant energy in uh, the dominant interaction mechanism. Uh, so all of what we've been talking about so far has been these uncharged photons, which we refer to as indirectly ionizing radiation, uh, because ultimately, they don't cause the ionizations that result in tissue damage. They ionize the electrons, which then go on to produce the, the tissue damage. Charged particles are, on the, on the other hand, 
are what are known as directly ionizing radiation because they are actually uh, producing tissue damage. And they interact via ionization and excitation. Also, bremsstrahlung. Uh, bremsstrahlung, however, uh, is very dependent on the mass of the particle uh, and is more common in lighter particles. So electrons, you might see bremsstrahlung. Uh, however, with protons or heavier charged particles, bremsstrahlung is pretty negligible. Um, and basically, we... we uh, so unlike photons, where the photon stays the same energy until it interacts and then it's taken out of the beam, right? Charged particles progressively lose their energy as they traverse the matter. So, so where photons, they interact in a kind of discrete fashion where charged particles interact in kind of a continuous fashion. Therefore, we don't talk about the attenuation coefficient like we do in photons, but we talk about stopping power, which is defined as the loss of energy per unit uh, depth traversed. Uh, the stopping power is described theoretically via the, the beta block equation. Uh, so this was developed by Hans Beta and Felix Block. Um, and it looks like a pretty complicated equation. It kind of is. Uh, but I want to draw your attention to one thing. The fact that this stopping power goes as one over this beta square. And this beta is essentially the relativistic velocity. So it's basically the velocity of the particle or essentially the energy of the particle as well. So the stopping power goes up as the energy or the velocity of the particle goes down. So that means as the particle starts to really slow down, uh, it starts to deposit more of its energy via this stopping power. And this is the phenomenon that is exploited quite readily in, in sort of heavy charge particle facilities, proton therapy or heavy ion therapy. Uh, and it's known as the Bragg peak. And here we see the Bragg peak. So the dose deposited to, to shallow tissue is quite low. And then it raises to a maximum and then sharply falls off. And the, the place, the depth where this maximum occurs uh, can be tuned by sort of modulating the, the energy of the radiation of the proton beam, for example. Uh, so ultimately, uh, if you want to treat uh, a tumor at a certain depth, you just pick the energy that you want to use that would sort of have its Bragg peak at that depth, and then you treat. Um, this technically happens for all charged particles. However, electrons are very light. So that when they're interacting, undergoing all of these sort of columbic interactions, they get sort of jostled all over the place. Uh, and hence, you don't really see this Bragg peak phenomenon, although the mechanism is fundamentally the same. But you see this Bragg peak in the heavier charged particles like protons or heavy ions. I uh, just want to very briefly touch on the measurement of radiation. Uh, so again, this is very preliminary. Uh, you could really take two semesters of classes on the measurement of radiation. Uh, but I just wanted to describe really the most important radiation measurement device, which is called an ionization chamber. Uh, so basically here you have a gas-filled cavity shown here in the white space. You then have a central electrode and an outer electrode uh, that are kept at different voltages. Usually there's a, a 300 volt difference. The ionizing radiation impinges on the into the cavity. It then ionizes some of the atoms in the in the gas. These ions are then swept to their respective electrodes, depending on whether they're positive or negative. Um, this, this charge is then collected. And if you had properly calibrated your chamber, you can then in, infer the radiation dose based off how much charge was collected. And, and this is done via 
uh, a process known as reference dosimetry. Uh, that is again a whole nother topic in itself. But basically, we can we can measure the charge and infer the dose. There are many other radiation detectors. I will not go into them. There's film, radiographic, and radiochromic. There's gas filled detectors, of which ion chambers are one example. Uh, there's proportional count. So if you then increase the voltage, you then get into the regime of proportional counters, eventually Geiger Mueller tubes. There's uh, luminescence detectors. There's semiconductor based detectors, diodes and diamonds, for example. These have very high sensitivity. So they're particularly useful when you're measuring like a very small radiation field. Uh, there's scintillation detectors, there's MOSFET, MOSFETs, et cetera. Uh, but again, this, this really could be a very two, two semesters of study. And ultimately, uh, a medical physicist needs to understand sort of the, the strengths and weaknesses of the various detectors and when one might want to use one detector versus another detector. Uh, so I want to switch gears very quickly uh, and discuss uh, diagnostic imaging. So uh, the most common diagnostic imaging modality in the world, and, and certainly historically as well, has been x-rays, which we've sort of discussed how they're produced. But then if you direct that x-ray beam into the patient, and then you put up a, a panel, which is like a two-dimensional array of radiation detectors uh, on the other side of the patient, you can then sort of infer the anatomic properties of the patient by looking at how much of the radiation has attenuated. So as an example, um, you have, uh, let's say bone, right? Bone is a very dense anatomical structure. Uh, hence, when the x-rays pass through the bone, many of the x-rays will be attenuated out of the beam. Hence, on the other side of the patient, you'll, at that part, uh, you'll detect very few photons. On the other hand, if you have a very less dense structure, like lung, for example, uh, not many of the photons will be attenuated from the beam. And instead, on the other side, at the, the panel detector, you will have... Um, you'll have many photons that are detected. Uh, so then by looking at the difference in attenuation, we can generate what is known as contrast and be able to see the patient's lungs, the patient's ribs, the patient's uh, uh, spinal vertebrae, uh, et cetera. Uh, but it's just a two-dimensional image, I must point out. Uh, so imaging physicists in particular are very concerned about uh, these image quality metrics, uh, and this is by no means a comprehensive discussion on this, but there are a number of image quality metrics that they are concerned about, namely the signal to noise. So basically how much signal you have relative to how much noise you have, which you don't want. Um, also spatial resolution, which defines how small of objects you can see. But I would probably argue that the most important image quality metric is that of contrast. So basically, at least in x-rays, it allows you to uh, see different densities or different thickness differences. So this can be illustrated in this figure here on the bottom left. As you can see, there are two paths that the, that the x-ray beam can, can pass by A and B. But if they pass through path A, they travel through slightly different thickness than through path B. Um, and hence, uh, there will be more photons attenuated at point B than at point A. Uh, so uh, basically, contrast, we then sort of convert the, the number of radiation particles that we detect into a grayscale so that we can produce an image. And contrast refers to sort of these differences in in our ability to resolve grayscale differences so that we can actually see pathology uh, next to healthy tissue, right? Because ultimately, if we're doing a diagnostic exam and the patient has pathological condition, 
we want to be able to see that uh, relative to the, the healthy tissue. Uh, so one application that's very important uh, of x-rays is that of mammography. So this is typically done in a screening setting. So for, for women who uh, probably don't have breast cancer, but they check all the same. Um, and the thing to remember about mammography is that we're really concerned with contrast. And this is because the microcalcifications or the very small tumors are very small. And B, they don't really have that difference in that much of a difference in attenuation properties relative to the dense breast tissue that it is encased, that these potential microcalcifications are encased in. So we really, really want to focus on contrast. And to do that, you need to remember back uh, to our discussion about um the photoelectric effects versus Compton scattering. So the photoelectric effect, if you remember, the photon was completely removed from the beam. The Compton scattering, however, the, the photon is not removed, it's scattered or deflected at some angle, right? And this deflecting of the photon actually goes on to degrade the contrast because then you're kind of misrepresenting the 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 path which the photon traveled, right? Uh, when you're when you're detecting it on the other side, if it's been deflected, you're kind of misrepresenting its position. So we always say that scatter degrades contrast. Uh, so you want to avoid scatter as much as possible. So you want to kind of upregulate photoelectric effect and downregulate the Compton effect. And if you remember, the photoelectric effect is more important at low energies. So we want to make sure that the, the energies are very low in mammography. For this, we use uh, molybdenum and rhodium as the target and filter combinations, uh, basically just because these have kind of optimized uh, energy spectrum so that we have uh, our, our energy of the, the X-ray beam is kind of shifted to the lower end. So we preferentially have more photoelectric effect. And I realize I'm at the hour, but I have maybe about 10 more minutes. So if you guys need to sign off, you you can do so. But if you uh, also want to continue to hear the rest of the lecture, I have about 10 more minutes. Uh, so the next imaging modality uh, that is x-ray based is that of computed tomography. Uh, so here, uh, basically, you mount the x-ray tube and the detector to a gantry that is allowed to rotate. You then take a number of X-ray projections um, at many different angles, and then you can use sort of mathematical techniques to then kind of reconstruct a volumetric or three-dimensional image. Uh, so, so where where X-rays were all two-dimensional images, with the the idea of uh, rotating the x-ray tube and acquiring projections at many angles, that allows us to produce a three-dimensional images. And uh, computed tomography, we call it CT. Uh, when it was first invented back in the 70s by uh, Hunsfield in the, in the UK, um, it was called computed axial tomography. So it got the nickname CAT scan. So people in the general public typically will call it a CAT scan. Um, but we call it CT typically. Another cool imaging modality is that called positron emission tomography or PET scans. Uh, so here, uh, basically we take a radioactive element, specifically a beta emitter, a, a positron emitter, right? We conjugate it to something right? And I'm being intentionally vague because there are many such applications. Um, that something then goes to wherever we want to image, right? And then the positron emitter emits positrons that then go on to annihilate with electrons surrounding the positrons. Uh, they then produce two coincident 511 kV photons. And if you put a ring of detectors around patient, you detect 
two events from these two uh, uh, 180 degree photons, right? And you, these, these two events are what are known as coincidences, right? And if you detect two coincidences, you know that the radiation must have uh, uh, emerged somewhere along the line connecting the two coincidences, what we call a line of response, right? If you then acquire data for a couple minutes, you can then sort of, you then have sort of enough statistics that you're then able to uh, perform a similar back projection type technique and produce an image. And the reason why I was being vague in the beginning was because uh, ultimately you can you can actually do this for for a number of different applications. The most common of which is what is known as fluorodeoxyglucose or FDG PET. And here, this relies on on uh, the observation made in the 1920s by Otto Warburg that cancer cells. Uh, have a sweet tooth. Mainly, they they exhibit very dysregulated metabolic properties. Uh, in particular, they have a very inefficient metabolism. And because of this, they're, because of the fact that their metabolism is inefficient and the fact that they're undergoing rapidly cell turnover, right? They they have the tendency to take in as much sugar as possible. So if you inject a patient with sugar, the sugar is going to go to the tumor preferential. Um, so what we do is we take off one of the hydroxyl groups in a normal uh, glucose molecule, and we conjugate it to uh, fluorine 18, which is a positron emitter. The, we then inject it into the patient. It goes to the tumor. We have a PET scanner detecting the coincidences around the patient, and we can produce an image like shown here in figure A, B, or C, right? And if I draw your attention to figure A, you can see that it's very useful of a technique for identifying metastases. So very unfortunately for this patient, right, because we can see sort of uh, uptake sort of all over the body spread in random locations, we see that this patient has widely metastatic disease. Um, and yeah, this is ultimately uh, very bad news for the patient. Even you don't have to be a trained radiologist to be able to look at this image and see that this patient does not have a very good prognosis. Another very cool imaging modality is that of ultrasound. Uh, so this is also very important in a global health setting because uh, ultrasound is relatively inexpensive compared to the other imaging modalities like CT or MRI. Um, and it was developed right after World War II, after a lot of the underwater sonar research. Um, and ultimately, the way it works is you have this, this transducer, which produces these ultrasonic waves, which are just sound waves that are at frequencies slightly too high for us to hear. Uh, we then match the transducer to the, the patient's body. Um, the so sound waves are then able to emanate into the patient's body. They then encounter structures, anatomical structures, and these anatomical structures, due to uh, acoustic impedance differences, bounce back. Uh, and then we can utilize sort of time of flight principles. So basically knowing the, the speed that the sound waves travel in tissue and uh, how long it took for the sound wave to be emitted and then come back, we can then determine the depth at which this structure occurs, right? And then produce an image in that way. Uh, and ultrasound is a very cool modality. I, I just want to point out that uh, in this global medical physics education lecture, if you want to go deeper, I gave uh, two... Uh, full one-hour lectures on ultrasound. So, so you could check out the the YouTube videos on on that modality. Uh, the final imaging modality that we're going to discuss is MRI. Uh, so, MRI is near and dear to my heart. If you remember the introduction, uh, Fumi said that my PhD was in MRI, and I've worked for about ten years now in MRI. Uh, so, it's by far my favorite. 
But unlike all the other imaging modalities where you can describe the general concept of how it works in one or two sentences, MRI, that is definitely not possible. Uh, so it's kind of a fool's errand to try to explain MRI in just three slides. But I guess I am a fool because that's exactly what I'm going to try to do right now. Um, so basically, you have this uh, fundamental nuclear property uh, known as spin. Uh, you can think of it as like a very tiny magnetic dipole, but it's it's quantum mechanical in nature. Um, and normally, in our the the protons in our body are the spins are oriented in random directions. And since there are so many of them, they cancel each other out. That's why we don't really see um, uh, magnetic effects when we're walking down the street in everyday life. The magic sort of happens, though, when we place this ensemble of spins or this collection of protons, namely the patient, in an external magnetic field. And this magnetic field will then polarize the spins and create a magnetic signal called a magnetization that we can then sort of manipulate and sort of detect a signal from it. Uh, the important thing to note about the magnetization is that it doesn't say static, but it actually processes or rotates. The, the proper word is nuttates around the external magnetic field. And this processional frequency is known as the Larmor frequency, uh, and it's proportional to the magnetic field. So the magnetic field that is experienced at a given point in space will cause the, the, the protons at that point in space to process with a specific frequency. The way that we produce an image is via this concept of spatial encoding, which was uh, developed very ingeniously by Paul Lauterbur in the early to mid 1970s. Um, so basically, the idea is that you add these additional magnetic fields known as gradient magnetic fields, which linearly perturb the, the value of the magnetic field so that at each point in space, you have a slightly different value of the magnetic field. Um, in this figure, say we're trying to image Homer Simpson's brain, right? We see that we have a gradient uh, going from the inferior direction to the superior direction. And at the base of Homer's neck, you have a smaller magnetic field than you would at the very top of his head. And that then translates to a smaller resonant or processional frequency at the base of his neck than at the top of his head. So if we then detect signal uh, and we look at its resonant frequency, we can determine where in space this came from. And since we're we're three-dimensional, we live in a three-dimensional world, we need three different gradient coils, the X, Y, and Z, one for each direction. But yeah, basically this is the concept of spatial encoding that is uh, integral in MRI imaging. Uh, so we ultimately collect the data in this spatial frequency domain called K-space. We then apply some mathematical trickery known as a Fourier transform, and we're able to get an image. And, and the really important thing to note about MRI is that it has excellent soft tissue contrast compared to all of the other imaging modalities, the X-ray-based imaging modalities, the, the ultrasound imaging. Uh, it has excellent soft tissue contrast, which is very important in many different applications, but particularly in cancer imaging, where cancer is typically embedded in soft tissue. So you wanna be able to distinguish between cancer and not cancer. Uh, the other cool thing about MRI is that it isn't only able to produce high, high quality anatomical images, but it's also able to interrogate uh, physiology or biological processes in vivo. And uh, yeah, again, this was a very, cursory uh, discussion of MRI, um, but if you're more interested, I've also given a lecture, a uh, full hour lecture on MRI, and uh, that is available on the YouTube channel. And uh, Dr. Marty Pago of MD Anderson also gave a talk on uh, MRI contrast agents, which is also available on YouTube. Okay, so the very end of this talk, I just wanted to to basically 
summarize what a medical physicist actually does, right? So for the last hour, we've been talking about a variety of concepts that are quite useful in medical physics, but we haven't really gotten into the practicalities of, of what a medical physicist does. And, and I felt like the best way to depict this is via this Venn diagram. Um, and yeah, so ultimately uh, in the US, we, and in, in many countries in, in the West, we sort of uh, delineate our medical physicists based off whether they are therapy or imaging physicists. Uh, in other countries, that's not necessarily the case. Also, uh, a medical physicist might be responsible for, for both of these. Um, but here in the U.S., we, we sort of specialize. Uh, so a therapy physicist would be responsible for calibration. So this is actually one of the most important things we therapy physicists do. We calibrate the, the output of the radiation-producing machines, the linear accelerators, for example. Right? And this is very important because if we miscalibrate the machine, right, every patient we treat will be mistreated. And it, there have been some horrible accidents in medical physics in the U.S. and I'm sure abroad as well, where patients were treated on miscalibrated machines and scores of people were, were, were killed, unfortunately. Uh, so calibration is a very important thing we do. Uh, we typically do it rigorously once a year, and we we uh, check it on a daily and monthly basis as well. Um, another thing that we do is commissioning. So this word is used for a variety of things um, in, in medical physics. But basically, the way that I'm using it is to describe sort of the, the characterization of the radiation beam that comes out of the linear accelerator so that we can then model it sort of three-dimensionally in the software that we use for the treatment planning. Uh, and this is done whenever we get a new linear accelerator, or we might have to commission the treatment planning system whenever we get a new treatment planning system. Um, and then also a radiation therapy physicist is involved in the radiation treatment planning uh, to some degree. So in some countries, the physicist is responsible for all of the planning. Here in the US, there is another uh, career called a medical dosimetrist. Uh, they typically do a lot of the, the radiation treatment planning where the physicist basically just supervises or checks their work afterwards. Um, and ultimately uh, is responsible for some sort of high impact type treatments like stereotactic treatments where we're delivering a high amount of radiation, maybe the physicist will be responsible for, for those types of treatments. Um, also, uh, brachytherapy procedures. So uh, we spoke about brachytherapy quite, quite a bit uh, in the beginning of the talk. But yeah, so ultimately tomorrow I have a brachytherapy procedure where I have to go in the morning to the operating room, uh, be there while the, the physician uh, implants the applicator or the device through which we will deliver the HDR brachytherapy, and then we will make a treatment plan, and then we will actually deliver the radiation uh, in the, the room where we have our, our brachytherapy source. An imaging physicist, a large part of what they do is compliance testing. So ensuring that uh, the imaging equipment is operating as per the vendor's specifications. Uh, they're also quite involved in protocol optimization. So all I didn't mention when I was uh, briefly describing these imaging modalities, but uh, there are many sort of parameters that go into producing an image, regardless what modality we're talking about. There are scores of parameters. Uh, so the imaging physicist is usually the one who is has expertise on how uh, modifying these parameters will affect image quality and when you might want to use certain set of parameters versus others. These are called imaging protocols and the imaging physicist is responsible for, for optimizing these protocols. Uh, there's also nuclear medicine, which I include in an asterisk because uh, in some countries like the US, uh, it's actually considered its own special specialty. Um, 
But yeah, nuclear medicine is kind of similar to what we were discussing about PET, uh, except there are other sort of imaging or even therapeutic techniques uh, involving nuclear medicine. For example, uh, you could you, you conjugate it to uh, uh, molecules that allow you to image for bone metastases or whether the GI tract is bleeding or for cardiac function. So there's many sort of functional capabilities that nuclear medicine is, is able to uh, uh, work with, uh, ascertain or interrogate. Uh, also imaging informatics, which is basically just uh, related to the transfer and storage of these imaging. Uh, then there are some things that all medical physicists do. Uh, the first and most important is quality assurance. So medical physicists are always doing quality assurance on their various technologies. Uh, so quality assurance essentially is sort of checks that make sure that the, that the medical device is operating in an optimal way in that its characteristics are not sort of changing over time. Uh, so in radiation therapy, we're doing quality assurance on, on the uh, linear accelerators or on the cobalt units or on the brachytherapy units. Uh, in imaging physics, we're doing quality assurance on uh, the imaging equipment, of course. Uh, another important thing that a physicist is responsible for is safety. Uh, so we are typically the ones who are in charge that, that the radiation uh, delivered is done so in a safe and effective manner, um, both therapeutically and diagnostically. Um, radiation, as you can imagine, can be a quite dangerous uh, material if uh, used improperly. So, so we physicists are the one that have the training and the expertise to ensure that that radiation safety is being adhered to. Um, also, for imaging physicists, MRI safety. So there, there is there are a number of MR safety concerns um, that need to be considered. Namely, uh, if you bring a metal object into the room where the MRI magnet is, that can then be ejected from your hand and sucked into the ISO center. And there have been very unfortunate circumstances where people have been impaled or crushed to death by these metal objects. So, so the imaging physicist is typically the one uh, who is ensuring MRI safety. And then for those of us that work at uh, academic or uh, 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 university-based hospital, uh, we are also responsible for uh, teaching and research and development. Although I must point out that a majority of physicists in the world actually are not academic in nature. They uh, typically just do clinical work where a smaller percentage of us have this academic focus where we also teach, we do research, et cetera. So with that, I wanted to thank you guys for your attention.